it's about, I think any long-term relationship is going to have things like that. We have to look in inside and do some introspection and think, wait, do I really love this person or do I love the way that they made me feel? I love this conversation. This is, this is so beautiful. This is so revealing. Uh, I honestly love you too, as a couple, I love how, um, you know, th there's obviously there's a, a very deep fundamental love between you. Um, there's, you know, I detect a deep compatibility that just needed to be unearthed. You guys have gone through a lot of trials and tribulations as you've had to deconstruct religion, you've had to deconstruct patriarchy, you've had to deconstruct shame, and you've had to really come into accountability for not only the, the things that you were thinking and feeling, but the things you were communicating or not communicating. Um, and so you have come a long way. You guys have been together for over 17 years now, right? So we've been married for 20. Yeah. And then this fall, if yeah, we got together in the fall, and we started dating. So we 22 years. Yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. long time. Maybe in 23. That is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a long time. <laughs> so what do you think is most compatible about the two of you? Uh, well, I think just the work, bo both willing to work. I think both willing to continue to work. Yeah. Both very committed to our family mm -hmm. in terms of our kids. I think that we're very compatible on that front. Yeah, I think we both mm -hmm. try to bring understanding. I think we both have a sense of humor. I think you kind of have to at some point in yes. time uh, if you're going to stay together. Um, but yeah, we talk about compatibility a lot because I think that if we had not grown up in the same conservative Christian religion, I don't think we would have found each other. No. And, and even if we wouldn't have gotten married, we wouldn't have sure. gotten married. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, there are many, many things I adore about you. But I don't even know if it's compatible all the time as much as just like, you know, a, a decision Practiced. to try to make it work. Practice. Right. So mm -hmm. um, it's not hard work for me to to like you or to love you. I, I think that that I but I don't know that that's always been reciprocal. I don't know that it needs to be, to be honest. I, I think that we have missions. I mean, you know, talking about like God and faith, but like one aspect of faith that maybe carries over is this idea of like being missional. Like what, what are, what are your larger goals? And so many of those are communal. So I think we have that in common. I think we both yeah. really care about our community. Okay. We obviously care about the the community of our family and making sure our kids have well being, And we deeply care for each other. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are really strong foundations and base for any relationship. It just happens to be that ours is married, <laughs> but we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what that means going forward, to be honest. And we hit 20 years being married just a couple of weeks ago. It was a point of reflection as many anniversaries are, but it wasn't necessarily happy. I think a lot of it was like, oh man, there's a lot of grief still to process. There's a lot of joy. So I think we're just trying to take it very gingerly and see how we can support each other best. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have we found a lot of commonalities. But sure. the funny part about us is that we're very, very, we're very opposite. And in fact, years ago in our conservative Christianity, we were interviewed by a missionary team that That's wanted true. to send us on a mission, basically. Mm -hmm. So they did like three days of like psychological testing mm -hmm. on us. And they said their Both findings though, were yeah. um, actually the two of you are as opposite as any couple we ever see. <laughs> they actually graphed us on a map and they're like, people that are as different as the two of you are, they either um, break pretty quickly, but you guys have seemed to found a pretty good way to honor each other's differences which wasn't, was kind of true. I think we're both, we're both just very level-headed people. Neither one of us is very prone to violence or irrationality or like well, this uh, reactive. We're not, neither one's really yet reactive. The gender roles you mentioned at the very outset, I guess. So so I, the way I remember the results, not, not that the, your memory of it is inaccurate, but I remember the results primarily being that both of us with our natural strengths were in the exact opposite spot of where we should be. So maybe that also constitutes how our relationship was working. But the Jamie is a very kind of gregarious, outgoing, influenceable, exciting personality that needed to be out of the home and out like exploring the world and meeting new people. And I am somebody who probably would have been better suited to like write some nonfiction books in my basement, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, our, our roles were entirely reversed where I was going out and trying to, you know, social worker deal with some of the, you know, the most difficult aspects of people in their darkest times, which I was happy to try to contribute to and feel like I was bringing a lot of value to, but that value was borrowed because I was taking it from home where you were supporting me and then going out and not reciprocating, not filling your cup back up. And I think really the real, if, if we were going to be married in some kind of alternate universe, still out of that fundamentalist Christianity, still met each other, but had had the courage to break out of those gender roles. As soon as we had yeah. that first kiddo, we probably should have switched. We should have switched. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm even much more financially ambitious. I think. I think like, so. I go yeah. like I got in tech sales a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. I got into that on purpose. It's yeah. really lucrative, yeah. and I, 
I got promoted right away and I went for it and I was high performing. Like, mm-hmm. and I love, he has like a heart of service. I love that. But like, if one of us was going to be out in the world making money, it probably should have been me. Right. Right. Yeah. So some of those influences, I think made it more difficult for us to find our compatibility because we were trying to fit the expectations of other people and the ones that we had internalized within ourselves. Mm-hmm. I wonder if, let's say you guys had met each other recently. I wonder if you would have sparked a romantic connection ultimately. That's an interesting question. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to answer. Yeah, it feels like it feels <laughs> impossible to We know. have merged closer to each other out of necessity and out of desire. So yeah. I think if, if somehow these two people met, I think there might be a spark. But I don't know that yeah. these two people arrive here in any other way. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't know. It's so That's hard to conceptualize to that. Yeah. And I think... I guess I think a lot of people like the narratives that are common in America are like happily ever after and like you know love at first sight and like um and a really heavy emphasis on romantic love as being like boss level of love mm. you you know if you if you haven't found romantic partnership then you are at the lower levels and your life isn't worth as much as the people who are coupled which of course is nonsense I don't believe that at all and Anyway, so I just, yeah. we have sit in a bit of a discomfort I, and it's not quite discomfort, but we we're, we're able to really yeah, acknowledge yeah. like, whew, this was really hard and ooh, a lot of things went wrong. And, and we equally hold this person is honorable. This person is valuable. This person has worked hard. Yes. And it's a tension that we sit in that I think makes some other people uncomfortable. Sometimes. And some, some uh, of the things aren't, they're not completely tied up in like a bow. Um, one of our kiddos came up. Hello. Hello. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be done in a little bit. Okay. I, I do think the compatibility, I, I think we're becoming more compatible every day as we understand each other, though. I I, I, I know now that at the outset of a relationship, I always say, like, oh, I love you. I love everything about you. And you would say, I think you're actually afraid of the real me. Yeah. And I was like, mm, mm. I didn't want to sit with that too long because I didn't want that to remotely be true. But the reality was out of my codependency and the way my family kind of grew up, I did want the things that I loved to be very near and very close to me all the time. I definitely had subscribed to the idea that the number one relationship indicator was quality time spent. But if you couldn't have quality time, just take the quantity of time, right? <laughs> you just got to be together. So for somebody who was adventurous and wanted to get out, I did love that about her, but I either wanted to follow with follower energy or I wanted her to stay home, which I think felt like being small. And neither of those were about loving you. They were both about making myself comfortable. And so I think that, you know, it's about I think any long-term relationship is going to have things like that. We have to look in, inside and do some introspection and think, wait, do I really love this person or do I love the way that they made me feel? And, and, and how does that shape and shift and change over time? So I, I think that we're on a good pathway that sometimes people ask us, like, will you stay married? I think the, the reality is we're not focused about that yeah, so much. We don't know. It's a mark sometimes. We but... know that we are each other's people. Yeah. Like, and, and we'll always be in each other's corner regardless. And that might look like a traditional marriage. It might look like a very untraditional marriage. It may not look like marriage at all at some point in time, but, but we're trying to move away from a sense of obligation being the compass that steers us. And again, just trying to be present to what are the needs and what, yeah, are what just is the now? person in yeah. front of me need today? Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that you gave yourself that freedom. My husband and I, we, we have a prenup. Uh, we don't have kids together and it's, it's a bragging point for him that every single day that we're together is because of choice yeah. and not necessity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're trying to lean into now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you two done a love language quiz? I think we did do one at one point in time. Like the traditional five love languages that, that yeah. one? Uh, gives, mm-hmm. acts of service, physical affection, quality time, uh, words of affirmation. Yeah, I think we did. Although to some extent, and I don't know, I, I'm not super familiar with this. I know that the person who originally wrote that book was a pastor with like no psychology, psychiatry background, but just things he had kind of observed. And I, I don't know, I we did take the quiz, although overwhelmingly in the circles that I ran in, women's women's men's thing was uh, physical affection and women's was acts of service. And that's because men feel touch deprived and women have no help around the house. So I don't know, for me, love languages didn't feel- Askew, yeah, um, the data. It didn't feel like a framework that was informative, but maybe there's some things that it's been a long time since I visited that information. So I'll tell you how it helped me. Okay. Uh, So my husband and I, so I don't know if you know this about me, but I was a stripper for 20 years. Okay. I I did. I think I knew that about you. Yeah. And -hmm. that's how I met my husband. He came into the club. He had, he had a rough day and his friends like, let's go to the strip club. So they went to the club. It was a Tuesday. It was dead. It was the first show of the night. 
um, I did my show and he saw me and something sm sparked in his head, came and asked me for a dance. I danced for him. He couldn't get me off his mind, came back the next day to ask me for a dance and asked me out to dinner. I said, no, I married. I was recently married. I still wearing my ring uh, because my husband at the time, uh, you know, shortly after he said, do you wear your rings at work? And I go, yeah, he goes, you should take them off. You'll make more money. So, you know, he happened to catch me when I was still wearing these rings. And uh, I said, no, I'm married. And then for two years, he was coming weekly and spending a few hours with me. And I got to know him because of that. So it was really like a two-year courtship, very wonderful courtship. I wasn't attracted to him when I first met him, but the more I got to know him, the more attracted I became because to this day, 18 years later, I describe him as the most outstanding human being I've ever known in my life. I've never known somebody more steady, more responsible, more in control of themselves, more hardworking, more kind, more generous. He makes me laugh more than anybody else. He matches me on physical affection, which was always a point of contention for me in all my past relationships because I am very affectionate. And my previous partners, I wanted too much, too many kisses, too many hugs, too many cuddles. So my husband and I got together and what started happening is I started saying, you don't love me because I work nights, he worked days. So there's the lack of physical affection because the lack of actual time together. His love language is acts of service. Both of us have two that had equal high scores. So equally important for me, physical affection, words of affirmation for him, physical affection and acts of service. Physical affection wasn't happening because of our time. But he doesn't do words of affirmation. He thinks it's a weakness if you need it. He's very strong on uh, acts of service. And so I wasn't getting words of affirmation. And I was not reading into his acts of services. So I was saying, you don't love me because I wasn't getting either of my love languages. And he would say, are you crazy? I've done this. I've done this. I've done that. So we did the love language quiz. And I went, oh, I need to translate. I need to translate his acts of service when I feel in love. So after that, because our brain will cycle in old habits before we break them. So I would still cycle into you don't love me. And then I would stop myself and go, wait a second. What has he done for you lately? And I would go into the past few weeks and I would find what he's done. And I go, there it is. And then for the words of affirmation, I opened myself up to accept love from other people. And so I would fill my love bank up in that way. So there is a 30 question quiz that you can find online if you Google five love language quiz. I encourage you to take the 30 question quiz. It'll take you each about five minutes to do it. Do it at the same time, exchange your results, have a conversation about the results. I think it might be helpful. Hmm. Appreciate your suggestion. I, I do think that the, the core of what you're saying there about how to translate and understand your partner is huge. So whether it's love languages or another rubric, I think that well, yeah. if people find something that works for them and helps them communicate, with their partner, then all for it. That's awesome. Can I give you one more tip? Sure. Yeah. So something that I talk a lot is intimacy. And I relate that a lot to kissing. So I have two rules when it comes to kissing in my practice. The first rule is when you're looking for a long-term relationship, no kissing for three months because kissing creates a chemical that's an amphetamine, aphrodisiac, and antidepressant. When I'm looking to choose the right long-term partner, I don't want to get drugged with a mind-altering drug that has me missing red flags. So boundaries first to make sure you meet my standards. When I do find that right person, and when we are living together, it's minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each, because sometimes the bedroom, when we have children, when we get tired, when we get older, when we get injured, when our hormones are off, what we call intimacy tends to be what we do in the bedroom. And if we don't hit the bedroom frequently for a period of time, because life we start to say there's less intimacy in our relationship. So I like to tell my people it's minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each forever. Your goal is to be 86 years old and pruny and making out twice a day so that you don't miss the intimacy in your relationship, even if the bedroom starts to get spaced out few and far between. My question to you is, are you guys doing that right now? I don't think that would actually be helpful for us, to be honest. I, I think this is the beauty of like how relationships work as the, um, something that could be. So we came from the opposite rubric, right? Where there were all sorts of rules about what to do and when to do them. 
And so for us, finding freedom to like be paying attention to the moment and giving, especially in this season of our relationship, giving space to the other person, I think is the right spot. I think it would be, personally, it would be detrimental to our relationship if we were to put some kind of rubric in that was um, robotic. I could totally see, or prescriptive. Mm -hmm. I could totally see how that would be very helpful from another perspective if you're coming from the other way and looking for some more structure or like more. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to consider it more. I, we had really strict rules for such a long time. And mm -hmm. even within our sex and intimacy life, I sort of put strict, well, I, there's strict rules for like the wrong word, but they felt like strict they rules. Felt, yeah. Sex mm -hmm. felt like a chore, but I like put it on a schedule in my own head. So I was like, gotta keep him happy. I forced my body to do things I did not want to do. Right. And a really deep part of the healing we've been through and finding intimacy has been to only engage when we know our bodies really want to. Well, and want finding to. that mm -hmm. like, um, finding that voice, I guess, re, re getting in touch with my own body because for so long I had taught my body to do things I didn't want to do. So I, I've had to like really start to ask the question, like, do I, is this really, really well, well I know. And how would it feel if I wanted it? And what would it look like if I wanted it? And if I did want it, how would I initiate it? And all these things that kind of went unexplored. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think, I think for sure, like maybe there'll be a time for like maybe prescriptive routines maybe is right maybe I, yeah. I, I don't i don't ever put any possibility out. i could like i said i could see how that could be helpful i think that in our particular uh stage it's actually much more helpful for us we, we know out of our background that we can do things prescriptively we know we can make ourselves do things when we don't want to those are valuable human skills sometimes but every valuable human skill is valuable in balance and so i think our paradigm is our, our, our pendulum has shifted and it's trying to go the other way and we'll find uh somewhere in between i hope at some point in time but right now it's been really nice and really healing to show up to each other when we both know we want to be there no sense of obligation yes so, 100 yeah. percent connection no like yeah no obligation mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. Has been helpful for us. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does. Um, I, I really want to underline how this creates intimacy that is non-sexual. Mm -hmm. And and so and also what differentiate what differentiates our romantic partner from a platonic partner is certain physical behaviors. So I may kiss my family and my friends like this, but I don't with my romantic partner that five second kiss is what creates a sensation that is different from platonic with my romantic partner and with somebody who may score low on physical affection it creates uh, an understanding of a minimal affection in a relationship that is creating a healthy intimate connection again that word intimacy and then also somebody who scores low on physical affection, I say set a timer because sometimes we have like there's a there's a squishy negative feeling to physical affection if you score low on physical affection in your love language. So I say, you know, get your phone and set a timer for six seconds. And so you put the phone down on the table and you press a timer and you have that one second to turn to your partner. And then you have that five second kiss and it helps you understand the duration of it so that you don't feel pressured to go longer than a minimal amount of time. And it helps you adjust to an intimate physicality, but because it's a non, because it's not sexual, it's not leading to sex, right? So you get used to a physical intimacy that is not a precursor to sex. And so there, it doesn't necessarily create the nervousness about the intimacy because sometimes as women too, we feel like anytime they're being physically intimate with us, it's because they're buttering us, buttering us up for sex. And if we don't want the sex, then we reject the physical affection. We've, uh, it's been very fortunate to work through a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. And and now know that that's not what's happening. Like we can just have right. yeah. touch or intimacy or kissing and doesn't have to lead to sex. And I think we have a, a high level of intimacy. I mean, maybe you're talking yeah. about compatibility, like in terms of like deep conversations or like- uh, There's a lot of cuddling. Yeah, yeah. well, a lot of cuddling, yeah. And so, even sex, we have a lot of sex. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that, yeah. Uh -huh. For us, we're just coming from the opposite direction, but I think we're probably headed the same way. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. I, I'm curious, like, so I, I am not, I don't have enough information to even like probably phrase this correctly. But it's my understanding on a very limited basis that sometimes folks who are, you know, um, professional dancers or sometimes folks who are in sex work 
kissing is a, is a, a space to maintain intimacy with your partner in ways that they like, look or function differently from relationships that are not in the, the circle or um, I work, guess the influence of sex work. Like, and so I, I'm curious how that, your background there influences your current position. I, I think that that's fascinating. The pretty woman syndrome, right? There's, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, I knew I wanted to be a stripper when I was six years old. I, I told my mom as much actually at that age. And for me, it was about dance and sensuality and the combination of that. And uh, so that that is getting on a stage, getting on a little platform in front of somebody and doing a dance. Uh, it was a connection between me and the music that uh, somebody paid to witness. And then also because I am so passionate about understanding humanity and I worked sober because I just enjoyed what I did at all times. People really found my conversations interesting. And so this is why I know so much about men because literally I was being paid to find out how men think. And I was studying social sciences at the same time. Um, and so I'm really good at what I do because I spent 20 years immersed in a culture where men were drinking, which is a truth serum, if we know. And I would sit in front of them with makeup and high heels saying, and how did you feel about that? And they had no idea they were being probed and discovered. So I'm able to bring all of that education to my people. I wasn't kissing the people that I was dancing for, but I, I do understand the intimacy of the kissing. Um, so for me, it was never a factor in my work, so I can't speak on that, but I know that, you know, as we saw in the movie, Pretty Woman, and I've even heard men say kissing is a much more intimate act than having sex. So, and this is again, why I teach women a no kissing for three months dating role, because, uh, you know, males that are just using for a body that's going to be convenient, they really don't care about the person in front of them often and so we have to weed out the people that are looking for convenience and using a kiss as a drug in order to gain access to the convenience again aphrodisiac amphetamine antidepressant but it's also those three drugs that has me encouraging couples to have those kisses every single day so that you're dosing each other with a chemical that makes you feel good yeah yeah it's something to consider i think like i, I think given our history prescriptive things feel a little, a little hard for me at the moment, just because like I, like I was in that prescriptive mindset and ended up becoming so harmful and really making sure I'm showing up in any physical event with my full heart and my full mind and my full, um, yeah, my full autonomy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, uh, yes, million mm -hmm. percent full autonomy, which unfortunately religion wants to take away from you. Yeah, yeah. Right. I will say that. So for us, like, having some space without without any pressure was very helpful. I do think that what you're saying though has some some wisdom to it though. In that I think that there are times in at least in talking to friends that there are relationships where like you know sexuality has become a, a a hard thing to navigate. And I do think that sometimes the temptation is maybe it will just fix itself. And I don't. I think taking space as an action is different than in action, right? So I, I think that, you know, the idea that you would show up to your partner with goodwill, with full autonomy and try to work through something uh, also has a lot of uh, wisdom to it. So I, I appreciate your, your framework for that. And I appreciate you answering the question. I was having a conversation with one of my watchers today because I do daily live streams. And she has been incorporating minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each. They have small children in the home. The oldest, I believe is seven. And uh, they have increased their happiness as a couple. And I asked, do you feel like your children are happier as well? And she said, yes, I've noticed an increase in my kids' happiness. And it was a, at first they were like, ooh, mom and dad are kissing. But I'm like, ooh, mom's gonna go get a kiss, right? And so, because they see this increased happiness in their parents, the emotional temperature of the mom is where the home revolves around. And so uh, I, I love increasing happiness in women however I can, because it does increase happiness in the home as a whole and the children as well. So if I can help you guys in any way, shape or form, I love this. I, I did write a book called Dating 101 for the teens. If you were thinking about helping your kids when it comes to sex ed, 
I divide us into three parts, the biological body designed to procreate, the logical mind designed to assess, and our spiritual connections. If you think about each other and you're not even in the same room, like think about your partner and a minute later you get a text message or a phone call, you're like, I was just thinking about you. It really shows how we don't even have to be in the same room in order to communicate. And I really want to help people understand how we are infecting each other, even when we're not talking. So uh, hopefully that is something that you guys would consider to maybe help educate your children in a way that you weren't educated yourselves. I think that, um, yeah, we're open to all sorts of, uh, you know, feedback. I, I think what, I'll say this about Jamie. Jamie, I think has been very, very uh, good at this, that like, oftentimes in parenting, you're reacting to where you came from. <laughs> so I think if we've done anything, we may have like overreacted in terms of like being very vulnerable and honest with them, inclusive of like sexuality. But mostly I think you do a really good job on that. I, I, I'm maybe not as skilled at it, but I, I feel oh, there's always yeah. room for improvement. Always room for improvement. There's always room yeah. for improvement. And it's, yeah. it's, I always hope that sex and sexuality is an ongoing conversation yes. with our kids. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's what I've kind of aimed for, even though they don't, I don't think they love that. <laughs> I don't think they love that. <laughs> always it's an open, yeah, so it's an open I, and ongoing conversation. But I do, I, I, you know, I do often get books and just set them on the, ta mm -hmm. on the table. And I have, all of our kids are pretty big readers. Yeah. Um, as a way of generating some conversation on the topic. It's so. true. Our kids' mm -hmm. friends actually have noted that. Like, like, we've never been to a house that has like clear distinguishing marks between like eras of a family. Like you have all these Bibles and you know like a uh, religious literature next to Girl Sex One Hundred and One, and like, <laughs> like, like what's happening? Uh, so. so we we yeah, I do often try to prompt, and I'm, I'm open to it's you know it's very fascinating. Like they're and just. I want them to find their own voice yeah. too. I mean, that was part of the problem was that like a voice was shoved at me. Right. This is your voice. Yeah. Um, and so while I, I want to give them what I think is more like guiding principles is what my hope is. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like maybe that's kind of so, the direction yeah. you've gone. Like you've told, given them some background information. And then from there that they can use that as like a guide to come up with their own sexual voice or their own ideas about romance. I love this. I love you too. I really do. I love your journey. I love your relationship. I love watching you two have these talks because I really do see the love and the bond between you and the desire for openness and communication and growth. And I, I think so many people should follow you. Uh, as I say that, I should give your handle on TikTok, which is jfisher62 mm -hmm. on TikTok. So I hope people do come across this and follow you. There's lots of Jamie. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think my at is at lots of Jamie. Yeah, I think. Definitely. I don't remember. It's funny. <laughs> I haven't looked at my handle so long. Yeah. Although we do have a YouTube also, I guess it's Josh and Jamie. Like, uh, yeah. So yeah, you can find us a few different places, but we appreciate mm -hmm. the shout out. Yeah. I love this. Do you guys have any questions for me before we go? really enjoyed the conversation yeah. our kids are just getting home from school so yeah we'll it's a good our, time our check in and make sure they're all right uh with new school year but it's been a pleasure to be here with you yeah i appreciate the conversation huge huge pleasure i am honored that you guys came and chatted with me because i have so much respect and admiration for you both oh, yeah. it's a pleasure to be here and thanks so much thank for the so invite much. and yeah wish you well in your continued work thanks for your service thank you we all appreciate you I can do it for